Hello and welcome to this very special episode of Crush Your Mountain Personal Growth. I wanted to share with you the individual today because years ago when I was a kid, I had the privilege for a very short time to volunteer with the United Cerebral Palsy up in New York City. And what really dawned on me was the need of people to be there for others who are disabled in some way, to help them to see a path forward, to help them to know that in spite of whatever disabilities that they have, if they push forward, if they crush through their challenge, they will thrive. And my guest today is an excellent example of that. So we're going to talk with Paul Forcion. And we're going to learn what his story is in terms of dealing with cerebral palsy, how he's overcome it, what it took to overcome it, and what he's doing now to help others to thrive in this day and time, regardless of what they may be dealing with. So, hope you enjoy it. Hey, if this is valuable information to you, if you find this information moving in some way, if it makes you think, if it's at least entertaining, do me this favor, leave a like, subscribe to our channel, and tell me again in your comments below what you think you can do to crush your mountain. Let's watch. Welcome to this very powerful edition of Crush Your Mountain Personal Growth. I want to tell you that if you remember a while back, I had a, a brief discussion on my YouTube channel about limiting your beliefs or getting rid of your limiting belief system, your LBS. Well, I have with me today a mindset coach, a motivational coach who is the epitome of just that how he overcame the limiting beliefs of the, a very personal challenge at a very early age. In fact, this is Paul Fortune. He's a motivational coach. He runs a call to action, which we'll talk to him about. Paul was born with cerebral palsy, and it was so severe that doctors told his mother that he would never, ever walk, never be able to do it. But now, the one thing you need is someone in your corner. And in this case, it was a wonderful mom and a great mindset that told him his story was not going to be what the doctor said. He was able to overcome it. He crushed through it. Now he was able, he lives a very active life. We've talked for a good while. He's a, he, play, he plays, uh, he plays baseball. He does so many different things. He's a motivational coach and a mindset coach. Paul shares his story with clients to help them to overcome their own challenges, rewrite their own stories in order to fulfill their true dreams as well as their desires. So we're going to have a deep dive into his mindset, his thinking. We're going to learn so much about this amazing person and what it takes to overcome a very personal challenge like that. Paul Fortune, welcome to Crush Your Mountain Personal Growth. Hey, Henry. Wow. That was a wonderful introduction. I'm honored. Thank you for that. Well, listen, you're an amazing individual. You, you, when we first talked, and you told me your story. I worked with the United Cerebral Palsy years ago as a kid. And, you know, it's a funny thing. My mom kind of tried to get me in, told them all I was like 14. I was like 11. <laughs> so it didn't quite last. <laughs> you know, but you're kind of short for 14. You know, <laughs> and so, uh, so I'll tell you, though, when I worked with individuals and what touched me is helping them to see what was possible because everyone there was trying. So I want to hear your story from the beginning. Please share with my audience because I know they're ready to know exactly how you went from from A to success, A to S. Absolutely. And while I tell my story, feel free to interject and ask questions if, if you want to, Henry. 
Um, so yeah, you mentioned that I have uh, cerebral palsy. And if your viewers don't know what cerebral palsy is, it's lack of oxygen to the brain at labor. And as a result of this lack of oxygen to the brain at labor, it can leave one side of the body paralyzed. It can affect your speech. And these are things that are permanent. These do not go away. So after I was born, I wasn't moving the right side of my body very much. And naturally, my mother was very concerned about this. And she got me to the doctors to get some testing done. And that's when I was diagnosed with cerebral palsy. And this first doctor thought it was so severe that he thought I would never, ever be able to walk. And when I got to a certain age, it'd be a good idea to put me in a wheelchair because that was going to be my life going forward. I've had many conversations with my mom about that moment. And uh, she shared with me, naturally, she was very, very devastated by hearing that news. Matter of fact, she cried herself to sleep that night, wondering what the life was going to be for her baby boy. And the next day when she woke up and got me ready for the day, I'm, I'm an infant, so I can't talk yet, whatever. She said, I gave her a look, a look if to say, mom, don't let this be my story. I want to walk. And that mama bear inside of her started raging inside. And she got a second opinion, a third opinion, a fourth opinion, a fifth opinion, finally found a physician willing to help. And with this physician's help and me doing physical therapy five to six times a week and my mom's unrelentless attitude to make sure I walked, I was walking between age two and three, a feat that four of their doctors said it wasn't going to happen, but it was happening. Now, I don't remember that much about it, but I do remember being put into soccer roughly when I was about five years old. And at the time, I probably could run 25 to 50 yards before my leg would give out. So basically on the soccer field, I'm basically standing there while kids played soccer around me. And one day after practice, I'll never forget this. I was just fed up. Kids are teasing me. I'm not having fun. I was going to my mom and tell my mom, I'm going to quit. This is it. I'm done. And I remember what my mom told me because it stuck with me to this day, this very day. It still sticks with me, sticks with me. She told me, Paul, if you do not want to play soccer anymore, that is fine. But you need to honor your commitments. So you need to finish out that soccer season. If you don't want to play soccer after that, that is fine. And that's has stuck with me with any everything that I, I do. And whether in my personal life, in my business life, I honor my commitments, whether it's in a contract or whether I verbally agreed, I honor my commitments. And after that, if I don't want to do it anymore, I reassess the situation and I make that decision. And like soccer, I really didn't like soccer. And that was the last time I played soccer. I'm 41 years old and I haven't played soccer since that, that season there. Well, right after that season, I got a... Did you, I'm sorry, Henry, did you have a question? What do you play? Yo? I'm going to make sure because I, I did mention that you play ball. So what do you play? Well, how, how have you well, now, well, now, well, now, I mean, I, you know, uh, now I probably, the only really sport that I play now is probably golf and okay. I run. I don't know if running, uh, you consider that a sport, but I, I oh, golf yeah. and I run. Oh yeah. They do consider that a, a sport. That's, that's what a marathon is all about. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Printing and all. Okay. So now tell the, the amazing thing I find is your mom's relentlessness. Okay. Because she didn't stop at one or two or three or four or five. Did you ever ask her, and did she ever disclose to you, what was the moment that made her know that that doctor was willing to work with you and help you? Well, yeah, well, when I talked to mom about that, she goes, she was not going to stop. There was not a number in her head about how many doctors she was going to go to. She was going to a doctor that was going to say, I can work with them. And it happened to be the fifth doctor. And uh, with his examination, he felt like th there was there was a strong chance that I would be able to walk if, if I put in the work. And if my mom put in the work and my mom was all about putting in the work, she wasn't going to stop. So as a result of my mom putting in the work, I put in the work because I'm an infant at the time. So I basically did what my mom told me to do. Um, and, and that was doing physical therapy five to six times a week. She, she followed the doctor's orders to the T. And mm -hmm. with that in mind, that's why I, I was walking. So um, I, I can't say enough good things about my mom. She's still alive today, still a big part of my life. But yeah, I mean, she was, there was not a number in her head that was going to prevent her from getting the answer that she wanted that I was going to be able to walk. So that foundation early on of 
do it, commit to it, no matter what. And by the way, the reason why I really love what your mom said is because in, in my practice, I follow the CRUSH method and the first letter of CRUSH, that C stands for conceive and commit. And that's what your mom did. She conceived of the possibility mm -hmm. and then she committed to it. And then she taught you to commit to your responsibilities, commit to your, 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 your contracts as it were. You see, and that's an amazing thing. You know, back in the day when I was doing real estate, they were training me for real estate. I don't know how it is in, in, in California, but back home in New York, uh, they say that back in the day, a contract was actually good for 24 hours, just on, on your word and a handshake, because you were expected to honor your commitments, you know? And so I love that about you. Just so it brings back those understandings of this is the foundation of essentially human society, the concept of commitment, the, the idea of being able to conceive of what's possible. Tell us more about your journey now, moving through school, moving through college. How did you how, how did you um, navigate the world of individuals, especially the naysayers? Absolutely. So right after that soccer season, I got surgery on my right foot and it tightened up my tendon, gave me a little bit more spring in my step and kind of took away the pain I was feeling when I ran. And this surgery was a game changer. And I didn't know at the time how big of a game changer it was. I switched schools around this, this time after my surgery. And I remember my first day of PE, physical education, we did our stretches and the teacher says, okay, guys, run a lap. And I'm thinking to myself, here we go again. I'm going to run 25 to 50 yards. I'm going to stop. These kids are going to see that and they're going to start to tease me but because of the surgery was different. I was able to go past that point where I normally have to stop. But I remember saying to myself, come on, Paul, come on, buddy, keep going, keep going. And I finished the lap with the other kids on the outside. It kept it cool. But on the inside I was like, yes, 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 yes. The first time in my young life where I just fit in, I didn't stand out. And it was just a great feeling. And as a result of the surgery, th things did get easier for me, but I wouldn't consider them easy. Uh, when I was about 12 or 13 years old, my parents divorced, so I had to switch schools. And that's a tough age to switch schools for any reason, okay? Uh, kids are going through hormonal changes. They're becoming teenagers. And a lot of these kids have been going to school with each other for years and years, and they already formed their cliques, and they don't have time for anybody new. So just being a new kid alone is going to be a tough feat. But I'm a new kid who walks with a limp and holds his right arm a little bit differently. So it was even tougher for me. I really couldn't get friends at the school. Bullied, teased quite a bit, spit on, tackled on, you name it, they did it to me. And I come from this old school mentality where you're not supposed to squeal, you're not supposed to tattle. So I kept all this, this, this pain inside of me and followed it up, which obviously is not a good thing. And while this is going on, I was raised Catholic, so my mom wanted me to go to Catholic high school. So I had to take an assessment test to see where they were going to place me when I got to high school. Well, I must have bombed it because when I met with the principal and my mom, the principal tells the both of us that she's going to put me at the lowest level possible and she doesn't expect much from me. I don't seem like I'm going to be college material after one test. This principal says this wow. to me. So now I think I'm stupid. Mm -hmm. I'm stupid. And now I'm going back to a school that I'm getting bullied and teased in quite a bit. I'm crying myself to sleep most nights saying to myself, why do I have to go through this? Why can't I just be like any, any other normal kid? I, I, I just wanted that. And I don't know what came over me, Henry, but the start of eighth grade, I was sick and tired of being angry and sad all the time. I knew those weren't my go-to emotions, but because of the environment I was in, those were the emotions that were coming up most of the time. And I thought, what if I focused in on something and laser focused on that and that will help me ignore the noise. So I thought, what if I set a goal for myself? I thought, what, what should my goal be? And at the time I loved baseball. So I, I made a goal for myself to try to make my varsity baseball team. So I started playing fall ball, winter ball, spring ball. And if I wasn't doing that, I was throwing a tennis ball against the wall. And while I'm going through this journey, a coach comes up to me one day after practice and says, Hey, Paul, you play a lot of baseball. Is there any goals or anything you want to set with that? And at the time, I didn't want to tell him what my goal was because I didn't want him to laugh at me because uh, he, you know, I'm having cerebral, I have cerebral palsy. There's no way I'm making a varsity baseball team. So I said, oh, no, no, I just like playing. 
but he was persistent. He asked me a couple times. Finally, he caught me at a weak moment. And I told him my goal that I wanted to make my varsity baseball team. And I braced myself because I thought he was going to laugh at me, but he didn't. He paused for a second and he said, that's doable. And I'm like, what? That's doable. He goes, yeah, it is doable, but you got to have other people keep you accountable for this goal. And I'm like, what do you mean by that? He goes, after practice tomorrow, you're going to go in front of the team and you're going to tell the team that's your goal. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I don't want to tell the team. They just started accepting me. They stopped making fun of me. If I tell them that, I'm going to give them more fuel to make fun of me with. He goes, Paul, if you really want this goal, other people need to keep you accountable for it. So reluctantly, I went in front of the team. The next day, I was shaking. And I told the team that I wanted to make my varsity baseball team. And again, I was bracing myself for them to, to laugh at me, but they didn't. They clapped for me and cheered. And the great thing about this, I know this now, but uh, I didn't know this when I was going through the journey. Um, I started sending a different energy out towards kids. I started gaining more confidence in myself, my shoulders back, my head up. And as a result of this new energy that I had inside of myself, uh, they started sending a different energy back towards me. In other words, instead of bullying and teasing me, they started rooting for me. So my high school career was much different than my middle school career, all because of my energy shift. And that alone is the win. But the cherry on top of the whole thing was I was able to make my varsity baseball team as a junior and a senior. In my senior year, I pitched a three-hit shutout. They poured the Gatorade on me, and I felt so alive. I felt so great about myself. Yes. Then I graduate high school. I'm sorry, Henry, did you want to say something? I'm, 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 uh, I'm just in, in, enthralled with the story. Okay. So I, I graduate high school, and I really start to really think about that goal that I set earlier about uh, making my varsity baseball team. When I first started that goal, I thought there was no way of making that, that varsity baseball team. It's just a way to ignore the noise, but I was able to do it. So I started to think about what that principal said to me years earlier about not being college material. See, all through high school, I pretty much mailed it in. I just did enough to stay eligible to play baseball because in the back of my head, I'm like, what's the use? I'm not college material. Let's not waste time. Let's just do enough to get by and move on. So my grades weren't that great, but I thought, wow, if I can make this goal about baseball, why can't I make another goal to say that I am college material? So I enrolled into a junior college because I was the only place that would accept me at the time. I got myself a math tutor. I got myself a tutor for other subjects. I went to the math lab. I did this five times a week. I did everything necessary to increase my grade point average. And with this, all this hard work, I took my barely a 2.0 all the way to 3.5, where I was able to transfer to a four-year university where I graduated and become college material. And I so wanted to go back to that principal and say, see, see, you were wrong. I was college material. But I thought about that, Henry. Um, I should probably thank this principal because all through college, I had her voice playing in my head saying I wasn't college material. And all through there, my next thought was, I'm going to show you I am. So because of her voice, uh, it gave me the motivation to hit the books harder than if I did, if she didn't say anything at all. So I, I thank her for that. So and I move on. I ask you a question. Yeah. So, now, do you take in consideration that chorus of naysayers, the ones that put you in the box, the ones that bullied you, the ones that made fun of you, mm -hmm. okay? The ones that would call you no account, mm -hmm. okay? Would you say, that in some way, just knowing that they had that attitude of you was a fuel for you to propel forward in spite of their challenge, in spite of their attitude. I definitely feel that way about the principal. Um, I don't, uh, yeah, I, I guess I would say yes. I would say yes on the other end too, because um, I set a goal for myself because of that. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, yes, I, I do think that 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 did, that did give me fuel. Now, I mean, I, I really would have rather go through a different situation, but it, it is what it is. It definitely, it definitely did give me the, the, the fuel I needed to, to, to hit my baseball goal. So yeah, to answer your question, yes, I, I agree with that. Do you experience any sort of other physical um, discomfort due to the cerebral palsy now that you will find yourself working through? I don't have any, any pain, but, you know, I still walk with a slight limp and I still hold my right arm differently. But as far as 
limiting myself. No, I, I I've done everything that I've wanted to do. I mean, I even run a, I ran the LA marathon. So I, I've, uh, so you do I, run a sport. Yeah. That was a, co- a couple of years back, but yeah, I, I did, I did, I did run a marathon. I mean, uh, my time was, was, you know, what modest, but I mean, my, my goal wasn't for that. My goal was to finish it. So, and I did do that. You know, that's the idea really behind the marathon is to finish the marathon, you know, uh, you know, there are those that run, they get, they get there in a certain period of time and they're happy to be the first one to cross the, cross the line. But in the original story of the marathon, I forget the name of the uh, character, he was running to tell that the war had been won. Mm. And he ran all this way at top speed and he kept running, he kept running, and he kept running, he kept running. But at the end of the run, he dies. Oh, no. Well, so in honor, the marathon is celebrated for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is this. There are individuals out there who may not be so fleet of foot, but they are steady and they have that goal. They are relentless in their determination to get to the next level, you know? And that's what makes me think of you, you know, you're not a turtle, but the old story that the turtle would say is slow and steady wins the race. You know, in other words, you keep going, you keep at it. Sometimes you have that burst of speed, you run and you flare up like a supernova, but then you fall back into your own black hole. God help you if you suck people down with you. Yeah. But if you are steady and you keep moving, you build your energy and you let the energy of others, good or bad, propel you forward. You know, that that's that's the uh that's the key to a sustainable and sustained success and and achievement. And in the first sense of achievement, and you tell me if I'm right. The first thing about the achievement is it settles here. It makes you more. Yeah, I think that the first thing about achievement is belief in yourself that you can do it before you even do the result, the belief that you can do it. I think that's where it starts, believing in yourself. And I think once you start believing in yourself, then the sky is the limit. Because when you hit challenges, no matter what goal you set for yourself, you're going to hit challenges. And if you truly believe in yourself, when you hit a challenge, you're going to go, well, this is, this is a little tough, but I got belief in myself and I really want to accomplish this goal. So whatever this challenge is, I'm going to find a way out of it. It might take me some time. I might need to have some patience, but I'm going to find a way over this challenge. Whereas if you do not have belief in yourself and you hit a challenge, Sometimes that's when you start to come up with excuses on why you don't want to do it. And it might, might start with your, your, your self-esteem. Do you really believe that you can do it? And I think that's where it all starts with everybody is that, that, that belief in themselves. And that's where, that's where it came from me. Um, when I was going after that baseball, um, there was a time in high school, I, I started, uh, I think it was end of my freshman year playing summer ball. I, I had a belief at that point that I was going to make that varsity baseball team. And at that point, I did have challenges. I had challenges my sophomore year, and I didn't make my varsity team in junior year until, uh, until you know, towards the end of the, of the season. Um, but I had belief in myself that I was going to make it, make it happen, and I was able to do it. And it all started with belief in myself. Yes. Once that shift happened, once that shift happened, I started uh, skyrocketing. Yes. So tell us about, your Facebook group rewrite re, rewrite your story because I've joined it and I and and I love your content there and I want others to know that they can do the same. You don't have to stay in the job that you hate. You don't have to be in the circumstances that you hate. You can rewrite your story. And by the way, by the way, your territory of your life is malleable and shapeable like the very territory that we live on the very earth that we live on the earth you see so you can be your own tectonic shift so please tell us about rewrite your story 
So it all came from the origin of, of, of my life and where I come from as far as getting into college and baseball and my career in mortgage and then my career in coaching. It all starts with rewrite. It all starts with taking back your pen and writing the story that you want for yourself, not for anybody else. Mm. Because all through my life, people have wanted to take the pen from me and write my story for me. And all through my life, I said, no, give me back my pen. I'm going to write my story. So that's where the origin came from of rewriting your story, taking, rewriting your story and taking control of your life. You're the author of your story. So take back your pen and start writing the story that you want to you wanna live. We only have one life to live it, so we might as well live it the way we want to live it. So that, that's the origin of the group. And we allow people from all over the world to share what's been going on in their lives. And we're there to support with no judgment, only there to support. And we have meetup groups once a month where we do it in a live virtual setting where people come in and we allow space for, for people to share what's been going on in their lives. And then after that, we have special topics like last week or last, last month, we had somebody talk about feng shui. This, uh, this, uh, this time we're going to talk about uh, engagement. So we all, we have all kinds of fun things that we do inside the group. And uh, I interview people and what we didn't, we talk about is what did you do to take back your pen? Well, where was that moment or where were those moments in time where you had to take back your pen or you wanted to take back your pen and write your story? And that's the origin of, of the Facebook group. And um, it's been a great, uh, it's been a great uh, couple of years. Now, many of my people are unfamiliar with feng shui. Okay. And you know, I kind of have some familiarity with energy work, Qigong, and different and modalities like that. But could you just share just a bit about what you learned in terms of feng shui and, um, and how it's used in the Chinese and the Asian modality? Yes. Um, I was the one teaching the class, by the way. So this is, I was one of the students. So forgive me if I'm not the strongest on, on this. But basically, it's, 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 it's a way of life on the, you know, on how you place your home, you know, is inviting, um, when you, when you sit your office, you need to face, face the door. Don't put your back to the door. Don't have unnecessary clutter. Um, just different, different little things, you know, like clean the kitchen, keep a clean kitchen. When you open up the door to your home, it's gotta be inviting. Uh, so things like that, like, uh, or like, um, like in the, if you if you want to have a family, you want to have uh, kids or something like that, then you 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 put different pictures of love and, and different things in, in the bedroom and just stuff like that. Um, so it's 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 a it's a way of life. Yeah. And so just to take it, just to kind of um, kind of expound off of that, you know, the the concept of feng shui actually also involves the concept of energy and. Build, and the belief is from that philosophy is that positioning things a certain way manipulates the energy around you. So to draw in the good energy, say for instance, your house or your desk or your bed would point in a certain direction. But here's what's interesting about it. Just like you said, when a person opens up the door to someone's house that does feng shui, or a person that both puts up the door to someone who is a really good interior decorator, you know, they walk in and you just feel this positive energy and you feel at home. You know, I had someone, I'm getting ready to get my house worked on. I had an inspector come in and my wife does an amazing job. And so when she came in to take a look at the house, the first thing was, wow, this is amazing, I feel, and she sits down, you know, and, you know, she said they had cookies, we talked and everything else, and next thing I know, she's got her shoes off, and since she's talking, you know, and why? Because of the sense of being at home, having that positive energy, so kudos to you for that particular uh, class, it was amazing. Now, now, here's the next thing I wanted to ask you about. You have other uh, coaching platforms that you work with. 
and you're a mindset coach. What are the challenges that you run into most often when it comes to helping your clients? Limited belief in themselves. That, that is, the, that is the, the number one thing that I help people do is breaking that limited belief in themselves. And that's a common theme in every single one of my clients is some sort of limited belief that, that uh, we want to break because it's just, it's just a thought in your head and we can change that thought to something better. And that's what it's all about. And that's what I, what I do for my, my clients and my coaching side of things. And, and then I do something similar in, in my speaking uh, way as well. But, uh, but that is the main thing is breaking those limited beliefs inside our heads. I have limited beliefs in my head that I need break it, broken. And I'm sure you do too. It's just, we just got to continue. We're a working progress. Every day we're a working progress. And that's what it's about. So talk more about a call to action now. You, you started that, that organization. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I, I, I started that about five years ago uh, while I was transitioning out of doing mortgage sales into this coaching business. Um, and um, for a while, when I first started this business, I, I wasn't getting any clients. And it was frustrating because a lot of a lot of the nays like we talked about the naysayers, a lot of naysayers in the mortgage industry was like, you're a, you're a, you're an awesome mortgage loan officer. This coaching things pie in the sky nonsense. You're going to fall flat on your face and you're going to get back in the in the industry. And for a while, I thought they were going to be right about this. Mm. Um, I finally did some soul searching on what the main issue was on why I was to get into clients. And the, and the issue was this, how do I expect people to be vulnerable with me if I'm not vulnerable with them? See, the story I told you about having cerebral palsy, I wanted to bury that story. I don't want to tell anybody that story because all through growing up, all I wanted to do was fit in. I didn't want any special treatment. I just wanted to be treated like everybody else. So in the thought of bringing up having cerebral palsy, I'd be near and dear in tears uh, if somebody saw me limping, I'd make up some silly excuse of a softball injury, this and that, because I didn't want to go there. But I thought the only way I'm going to make traction in this coaching world is if I own my story. So I started telling my story anywhere I could. And at first it was fairly choppy and I was very emotional about it, but I kept doing it over and over again to the point where I, I didn't have as much emotion to it. And I'll never forget my first client ever. He said, Paul, I do not have cerebral palsy, but I have X, Y, and Z, and I feel you understand me, and I would be honored to hire you as a coach. And then we just been start building momentum from there, coaching, coaching clients, speaking engagements, just building it from there. But it, I would never, none of that would have ever happened if I did not own my own story. Because when you're coaching, there's got to be an element of em empathy. If, if you're coaching somebody and they do not feel that empathy, it's not their work and they're not going to want to use you. There's, there's got to be a sense of this person's got to relate to you. We, you got to relate to each other in, in some form. And because of my story and what I've gone through, they can feel, you know, the passion in me about, about what I went through. And it translates into what they're, they're going through at this current moment in time. Oh, wow. Yes, see, now I totally get that because oftentimes that's what I'm, I do first. And I don't, you know, at work, work is kind of work and I'm a little bit singular in my, in, my, in, in my responsibilities. So I don't get a chance to really discuss and disclose all of my story, as it were. But I did share a little bit. We had last, last month was Mental Health, National Mental Health Month, and I did share with the company what I experienced being a caregiver with parents who uh, both had forms of mental illness. One was a personality disorder. The other one was actually early onset dementia as manifested through um, schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. You can imagine growing up in a world where it was a James Bond movie at some point during the day. Uh, that's kind of how things were many, in many cases, many times. And for I found for myself that for many years I was actually suppressing a lot of the memories of what I grew up and went through. As I began to do a, 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 an internal 
meditation and focus on things and really begin. I began to understand the changes and then being willing to share that with others was the game changer for me because so many individuals have those challenges or if it's not a mental challenge in that, it's just dealing with that crazy ex of mine or it's just dealing with that, 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 that my, my, my mother or my dad, you see, or in one case I had someone who had a brother who was very manipulative and they didn't know basically how to just stand up and say no, you see. And we had to take them through the series of exercises to help them to see what they, and how important it is that they understand who they are first and get settled in themselves and get determined to move forward and crush through and be, be effective and thus take stock and believe what they can do. And I really respect you for your journey. And I only wish you the best in your continued journey in calling to ask to call others to take action, but seeing you yourself take action. And we'll be seeing each other in the in the Facebook groups, you know, hanging out a little bit. So Paul, I just wanted to touch base with you. For, where can people find you uh, if they want to reach out to you? A couple of different places. Uh, one is they can go to my website, a call to action.coach. I have an ebook, free ebook on my website on how you can rewrite your story. And it talks about how you can rewrite your story and how I was able to rewrite my story. It's completely free. Download it off my, my website, a call to action.coach. And secondly, we kind of talked about it uh, through my Facebook group, Rewrite Your Story. Uh, it's a great community of people. We, we spring, you know, if you feel alone, this is the great group for you because there's so many people in there. If you reach out and say something that you need help, there's going to be 10 people that are going to respond to you and say, you got this, or, or they'll, they'll want to get you on a call or what, just to help you out. So it's a great community. And, and we, like I said, we do meetup groups once a month to get to know each other. And, and it's a space where it's going to be a safe space where you can share your, your story, parts of your story, with no judgment, and we're only there to support. So those are the two ways to get in touch with me. Very cool, very cool. Well, I, you know, I really, again, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us and share with my group your story. And, you know, like I said before, the limiting, limiting self-beliefs are the thing that can kill anyone. It'll kill your dreams, it'll kill your hopes, and it'll keep you from moving forward in life. So I want to encourage everyone to take action, to think about who they are, what they want to achieve, and instead of saying, I can't do it, say, why can I not do it? What will help me to get to the next level? Paul Fortune, I've got one more question I ask all of my audience, all of my guests, and you know, you've been through cerebral palsy, you crush through that, you defied the opinions of others, including your principal. You dealt with so much, including your business associates telling you this coaching business is high in the sky and ain't gonna work. So my question to you, Paul Fortune, what does it mean to you to crush your mountain? Self-love, giving yourself self-love. And that means if you're not feeling yourself on a day, it's okay. Don't put yourself down about it. We're human beings and we got to feel our feelings. But when we start to get into that funk where we don't want to feel angry and sad anymore, that's when we get into that gratitude. What is going well in our life right now? What is going to fill our cup back up? So doing things for yourself is not being selfish. It's necessary to get you to the next level. So. Put your auction mask on first, and then you can help other people. So self-love will help you crush your dreams. Excellent. So with that, again, we want to thank you so very much. Friends, again, if you enjoyed this information, come back next week. We have another excellent guest. And we're going to talk about some deep and powerful things, things that can affect you, change your life, or at least make a shift in the way you see things. So listen, once again, you know what I say? Don't just climb your mountain, crush through it, and we will see you next time. Paul, thank you so very much. Thank you, Henry. I had a great time talking with you.
Love you.